Hello everybody, Brad the Guitologist here. Enjoy the video. Hello everybody, Brad the Guitologist here. In this video we're going to take a look at this uh, early 1965 or late 1964 Gretsch model 6161. That sounds like something you'd be interested in. Stick around. Okay, here's the rear of this unit. As many of you guys already know who watch my channel and have been watching it for a long time, um, I just think that Valcos from this era are some of the best amplifiers ever made, the best sounding amplifiers for guitar ever made. Um, and they are really well built amplifiers. Uh, I think a lot of people don't realize how well made they are. Uh, these are finger jointed cabinets, as you can see here. Really tightly, um, tightly made, well made. No chipboard materials or anything like that in one of these. Here's the uh, serial number tag. And you can date these by the serial number as well. That little G on the front right there will tell you a, a year. Uh, this one I already know is 1965, just judging from some of the some of the codes. Right there is a 452. So that's the end of 1964, actually. 220s Jensen. Uh, two 10-inch speakers that you can see. And then there's a third speaker right up here a little tweeter I think that's a probably a I don't know that's like a six inch I guess speaker right there and again there's a uh, that one's a Rolla 33rd week of 1964 on that uh, on this output transformer we have a code as well of 1964 48th week 6973 output tubes, a pair of those, and these are RCA a variety. Most of these do have the RCAs in them. Uh, five, a uh, 5Y3 rectifier there, and we have uh, three preamp tubes here, and those should all be 12AX7s. It does have a 61, 61 stamp. Here are the controls. Uh, it's kind of an unusual layout. Uh, over here to the far end we have channel 1 control. Uh, it's just, just a volume, a bass and a treble input. That's labeled the regular inputs. Then you have a tremolo channel with, uh, for tremolo inputs. Bass and treble here, volume. And then you have your tremolo control. There is no depth control, it's just a rate control and it's foot switchable. You also have a tone knob over here in this section, and of course a fuse, switch, and a light. Uh, this one still has the two-pronged cord, which we will go ahead and change. This is getting basically um, a complete overhaul. So let's go ahead and pop the thing open. Uh, we'll pop this little back door off, and we'll see what we're up against. Before we get any further into this thing, a few things that I like about these Valco made amplifiers. Um, for one, the coverings on these tend to wear very well. Uh, they're very durable. I don't know exactly what they're made of, but it's a kind of a rubberized, I guess, material. Very, um, very durable. It takes a beating, uh, takes a licking, keeps on ticking. It's very hard to kind of nick one of these, and you don't see very many of these that are, you know, all frayed out or anything like that. Very durable coverings. Uh, these are kind of cool too because they have the the nice little white pin striping here, which is a which is kind of a good looking touch, something they didn't have to do but did, and it does improve the visuals on one of these. Uh, the grill cloths uh, they don't always fare quite as well. You can see this one's getting a little bit ragged in places, and what ends up happening usually is some of the cross hatching sort of uh, you know gets worn, especially around the speakers. You can see there. It's kind of following the line of the speakers. The more these kind of get pushed on, uh, the more it frays these edges. Uh, what I do like about these is that the whole entire front baffle will come out of one of these. So you've got, a, you've got some screws here. There's three on the bottom, and there's one in each corner up here. And if you pop those out, this entire baffle will just lay right down. And that allows you easier access to kind of the back of the chassis and everything as well if you need to get in there to service that for any reason. So they've kind of thought about a lot of different things with one of these and they're very well put together. This one of course is missing the logo. You can see the you can see the little nubs where the logo once was. This would have been a Gretsch logo. They do make those still. Uh, you can find them on eBay and stuff usually. Um, so if you really wanted to track one down you can. But just really well made 
amplifiers. Uh, the handles on these, you hardly ever see one with a broken handle. Uh, they are very, very durable handles. And uh, if you were to take one of these apart, you'd see that it's kind of the whole thing is is metal. This is there's no plastic here. This is you know this is a well-made handle. Um, the ones that are on the Gretches anyway. Some of the uh, some of the other ones like the Supros um, didn't have quite as nice of a handle. Um, so those do tend to break some, but but these on the Gretches do not. A little history on Valco. Uh, Valco was formed out of the ashes of the uh, National Dobro Company, um, and it's been around since the early 40s. Uh, they didn't really get to get started making a lot of stuff until after the end of the war. About 1946 is when um, they, you know, really started ramping up production with a lot of Supros and Oahu amplifiers and uh, things like that. You see. Uh, Valco was based in Chicago, and they had a lot of contracts doing amplifiers. One of their contracts was with uh, Gretsch, and they made Gretsch amplifiers from about the late 50s, I believe, on through 1968 when the company went defunct. Before we do anything else, we're going to go ahead and um, fire this thing up and see what it's doing or not doing. And right now I'm plugged into channel 1. Uh, that's the non-tremolo channel. Already there's some static. That's probably tube related, I would imagine. Sounds like it to me. Yeah, that's the second tube socket right there. We'll clean that in a bit. Control's a little bit dirty. Let's go in the bass input. That was the treble input. Yeah, just lots of noises and things going on in the background that, that need to be addressed. Um, let's check out channel 2. This will be running through a different uh, preamp tube. So. so the trim does work. It's actually not too surprising on one of these because uh, they are um, they're usually all ceramic disc capacitors so they stand up pretty well. Yeah, 
yeah, just a lot of harsh harshness in there, um, and that's probably mainly tube and uh, dirt related. But good points. Um, the Tremolo does work, uh, and both channels work, so it's got that going for it. Here's a schematic for this thing. Um, we'll just take a general look at it. Here's channel one. Again, we have a treble and a bass input. Here's channel two. Uh, again, treble and a bass input. Uh, you can see they each have a uh, half of a 12 AX7, which is independent of the other channel. Um, but what differentiates the treble and the bass inputs is uh, on the treble we have a capacitor, a .005 capacitor. So it sets a cutoff point for the frequencies that are allowed through uh, whereas on the base side we just have a 100k resistor uh, into the grid these are cathode biased stages and you see a 2200 bias here on this side and we have a 1500 bias here on this side with a bypass capacitor you can see the letter c here on channel two that's because uh, that c corresponds to this c down here this is where the tremolo gets injected um, the tremolo here is this is the oscillator so this tube uh, oscillates and it draws a voltage up and down and when this when this foot switch is closed or when the switch here is closed it affects the um, it will affect the bias of this tube and cause a voltage at the cathode here on C to vary up and down corresponding to the voltage that's varying over here and that varying voltage causes uh, a voltage to vary here at this cathode which causes the volume to, basically for this tube to switch on and off. We also have a bleeder capacitor here that's uh, going to ground so anything that does not get bled off here some very high frequencies get bled here if you wanted to actually rock this thing up slightly, you could probably even remove this little capacitor right here. These are very small coupling capacitors as well. This is a point zero 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 three into this next stage. You could probably change that up that value somewhat as well, and that would also beef up the the tone somewhat. But I, you know, these amps sound so good for guitar. Um, I would be really I would be really remiss uh, if I didn't just leave it alone as is. Um, a lot of these can be improved, but uh, most of these mid-60s Gretches like this um, with the 6973s and it, you know the Supros too and the Nationals and so forth, those are these are usually fantastic sounding amps and this one I don't think is going to be any exception. If you wanted to beef up channel one a little bit you could uh, put a bypass capacitor up here on channel one as well if you wanted um, but again we're gonna leave it alone we're not in here to do mods we're just in here to make the thing playable so okay let's get a look at the tubes that are in this thing and see if they're whether they're original or not I'm kinda curious and yes they should be 12AX7s and this one is an RCA 12AX7, so that's probably an original tube. I'm going to go ahead and clean the tube uh, pins. I'm going to uh, spray the tube sockets on all these. And there's probably better ways of doing this. Um, but this is kind of the way I usually do this. I, I just get a, a wire brush and just kind of brush the pins. You can't reach all the way around the pins, but it, it gets enough of it that it does make a better connection. Okay, this is the one that was really dirty. That was making the noise. And this is not an original tube. This is a Hewlett Packard labeled tube. This, these all should have been uh, RCA labeled tubes. This is uh, not. And we can see here from the date code, it's from 1971, actually. This one's got a bent pin as well, so that might be part of the issue. See that? It's kind of bent in right there. So the way to fix that is with a pin straightener. I have a couple different ones now. Um, but this is the most handy one. And these are really hard to find. I cannot find 
uh, pen straighteners. I mean, if you want to find a good one, you've got to get an old one. This is a CBS Hytron. That was a tube manufacturer. This one does uh, seven pins and nine pins. And I, I, I was lucky to get this. One common point of failure on uh, Valco amps from this era uh, are the tube sockets. The tube sockets themselves um, don't tend to hold up so well. I've had to replace a lot of tube sockets and old Valco amps. Uh, these don't look like they've been kind of worn very much. They don't, you know, they haven't been pulled and the tubes haven't been pulled in and out a whole lot on these. That's one thing you got to watch out for. You don't want to pull tubes just constantly on your amplifier because the the pins and the sockets are usually two little pieces of metal that kind of that kind of uh, expand out when the pins in and then kind of are supposed to contract back when it's out and what ends up happening over time the more you pull them in and out it just kind of comes out and then stays out so it doesn't get good connection you can retension them but a lot of times they just get completely worn out the metal gets fatigued and uh, when that happens there's not much you can do except replace Okay, now for the power tubes. And again, these are original RCA 6973 power tubes. Uh, they've been in this amp probably since it was new. Um, and they probably will last another 20 years if you, uh, as long as the bias and everything is, is good on this amp. You know, if you get a bad capacitor, a coupling capacitor or something like that, it'll eat them up. And if the bias drifts or something like that, or you you know lose bias, it'll eat them up. Um, but otherwise, these are pretty hardy tubes. It was interesting. It actually looked like what someone had done is, is gently bent out the ends of each pin so that it was they were kind of splayed. So when they went in these the socket here, which has no retainer, they stayed in the socket. Just an observation about this one. You can see the kind of uh, bit of milky white around the bottom here. Usually that that means this tube has been has been. Uh, really you know played a lot over the years also this um, paint would have originally been bright orange and it's faded to almost a nothing yellow so this tube you know this tube's been cooked uh, for a long time it's an old tube it probably but again it probably still has a lot of life left in it and uh, I'm not going to change it unless I don't usually change these tubes unless I experience issues like low output um, or other you know noise or some other kind of problem I think it's a fallacy to pull these tubes out of here and replace them with, uh, you know, inferior modern tubes that did not go through the same kind of rigorous uh, QC standards as these old RCAs um, when there's really nothing wrong with these tubes. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me to do that, so I don't. Uh, a couple of these pins are kind of loose, so I'm going to try to retension them. Okay, I hope you can kind of see what I'm doing here. Um, you can see these these little uh, sockets, and I'm putting this tool right beside one of them. And I'm kind of wiggling it to push to push this side of this uh, socket toward the other side. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to overdo it. And I don't want to break one of these because they're pretty fragile. It's kind of hard to do with the camera in the way. But you just want to get down on the one side of the one pin and just kind of gently, gently push it toward the other side. Just so that it tightens up a, a little bit. This is the tool that I've used and this is the way that I've done it. See how that's a little closer together now the gap is a little more narrow a 
Now that's actually a lot tighter. I could tell that that went in there much tighter that time. It it's still loose, but that's these uh, that's these sockets for you. The only way to take out all the looseness would be to change those sockets completely. Okay, so there are all the tube sockets cleaned and a couple of them tensioned. And uh, let's go ahead and pop this open. We'll pop this back door off and we'll change this power cord. Okay, here we are inside the guts of this thing. As you can see, the chassis on one of these is a pretty thin gauge uh, steel chassis that is um, plated in, uh, I guess it's chrome, chrome plated. Um, and it uh, has two pieces of wood, basically, that the chassis is bent around. So you have these end pieces of wood. The chassis is just a, is just a steel sheet. Um, that is bent in a machine to fit this piece of wood. So you've got one on this end, and you've got another one on that end. Um, it's kind of an ingenious way of doing it, and it's probably pretty cheap. You don't have to do anything as far as welding the ends together or any of that stuff. Um, and it's one of the corners that Valco cut in terms of produ saving production costs, and it makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, if I was going to make something like this um, in a production way... This is a pretty half decent way of doing it. And what they've done is just screwed in the chassis to the wood on both ends, on this end and on this other end. And they've done it from the top as well. But you can see here where the, there's a big block of wood on this side is also a pretty, pretty good thick chunk of wood here on the cabinet to stabilize all of this. And it gives you an anchor point for the chassis. But kind of an ingenious way of, of doing things, really. Um, probably saved them a lot in production costs. Uh, these do have mostly um, mostly ceramic disc capacitors. As you can see in here, there's a, some hiding down there. They're pretty much everywhere. A couple there. There are a few exceptions. As you can see here, we have a standard labeled. These are usually common failures on these if, if there's going to be a failure. There is another one hiding down over here. Uh, we have a shielding plate here that is attached to the input jacks. It's just basically soldered on two of the jacks. You see right here. And this whole thing just helps to further shield the inputs. And that keeps them from having to uh, do anything uh, to shield the you know back door. Which they could have they could have done it that way too, but the back door has nothing on it. But you can see here the Tolex. And the adhesive they've used is usually pretty good on these too. It's just, I mean, it's held held nicely. Um, and once again, there's no, I mean, even on late model Valcos, there's usually no chipboard material. They did not skimp on this stuff. It's just, you know, it's all good plywood. So probably uh, first order of business is to change these paper and wax capacitors. I think that's probably going to be about the only thing that we do with this amp. There's, there's a couple over here as well. There's one here, there's one there, there's one down there, and then there's two more further down here, and then we have uh, this capacitor here, uh, and there's going to be a, uh, uh, a can capacitor here for the electrolytics, and those are usually pretty good in these amps. I, I have rarely had problems, at least... Um, at least at this kind of juncture in their history with these being bad. I mean, that might change in a few years. You might see just a, a spate of a lot of these starting to go bad or something. But as of right now, I've rarely had problems with the, with the cap cans as used in Valco amplifiers. Uh, and this one seems to be no different. I, don't, I haven't detected any problems as far as that goes. Uh, in the few minutes that I had it on there, it didn't seem like the that cap can was an issue. I could change that out. Um, wouldn't be a huge deal. It's not going to improve the tone of the amp because I don't think that those are, you know, they're not bad. This thing is just cherry mint. I mean, this has not been touched by anyone. There's not, you know, huge mouse nests or anything like that. It's not like this thing has been exposed to a, a lot of moisture, it, it looks like. You know, it, it looks like it's been 
in decent storage its whole life. So probably what I will do is change the, each one of these uh, these paper caps. And again, there's about five of them. It's going to be kind of hard to get to uh, these down here because I'm going to have to remove this shielding plate. Okay, we're going to change the power cord in this thing, um, which is sort of hard to get to. It's kind of down in there. Now what we got to do is get a new uh, new cord, and I'm going to get a grommet to put in that hole. Okay, I could not quite reach uh, to get the um, new power cable in the way I was kind of going. You couldn't reach around the chassis, so I'm going to do it this way. We'll do it from the front. This will give us an opportunity to see uh, how this comes down. So you can see here, um, there's not a lot of lead on the speaker here, but... Actually, let's look. Gonna get it through this hole up here. And okay, I've already removed one of these capacitors. Now that top one. I'm getting this bottom one now. I've got one leg of it off already too. But you'll see what I mean and kind of how hard it is to get down to these. I've moved this uh, up out of the way so I can see my see what I'm doing. And you just gotta have some long needle nose to get down in here like this the way that they put these together at the factory I'm presuming uh, what they probably did was they had people on an assembly line who would assemble uh, one st whole strip so they would populate a strip and you would have one person responsible for doing you know this whole strip right here and they would probably just churn out you know 50 or 100 of these strips um, and then you know kind of send those on down to a further assembly I I'm guessing that's the way they did this um, and when they did they put these all on the bottom so they're kind of hard to reach but uh, there's a second one out of there okay so there's two of the five down I think we got and we have three more over here but to get to these get to these we're gonna to have to remove this uh, this shield right here let's go ahead and do that okay now we can see what we're doing and we also have a uh, we have a little electrolytic that's hidden down in there we may go ahead and replace as well There's one argument that says, you know, if it, ain't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But at the same time, when you're in here already, um, and you see something like this, you may as well go ahead and grab it. Now, these are well-made capacitors. This is a Mallory. Uh, 35 microfarad at 50 volts from 1964, as you can see. But you can see how they're made. It's kind of an epoxy that they have on this so it doesn't really expose to air or moisture very easily so these this is probably a good capacitor but we're going to replace it anyway Again, but we don't. It just goes on and goes on and goes on. 
Okay, so here is the service pretty much complete, I believe. Uh, we remove, uh, put a three prong cord on, and we removed the death capacitor, which was here before. And we replaced one, two, three, four, five uh, capacitors. Uh, replaced one, two uh, smaller electrolytics. Uh, cleaned everything, cleaned all of the inputs, uh, cleaned the jack for the tremolo, uh, cleaned all the sockets. I actually cleaned the face plate of this thing as well, um, and it cleaned up rather nicely. Okay, so what we'll do now is we'll plug it in, fire it up on the Variac, bring it up, um, test it again, see if there's anything else going on with it, and uh, address it accordingly. One other thing I've done is I've added a retainer for the power cord over here. We've got this big convenient block of wood to do it in, so I figure why not. So I brought the cable over here, so that way it's not, when you're plugging this thing in and kind of moving around, it's not hitting the... Uh, power tubes and it's not hitting any of these other wires over here so it kind of gets it over and out of the way and then down. Okay we're in the process of dialing this thing up and as you can hear we've got some noise and I think it has to do with this tube or this tube socket, one of the two. I'm guessing it might be this tube. I'm just going to grab another one here that's handy. This is not a 12AX7, it's a 12AU but I just want to see if it's uh, if we have more luck getting that noise to go away with a different tube. The socket seems nice and tight. I don't think it's that. Yeah, bad tube. Okay, what I'm going to do here, this is the, uh, this is a tube for the tremolo right here, I believe, V3. Um, yeah, that's the tremolo tube. So this one is not really critical in terms of tone. So what we're going to do is move this tube over to here because this is the as an original RCA 12AX7. So we're going to pluck it out of here and move it over to this position. And then we can use any old crappy microphonic tube in the... Uh, well, I mean, it, you, what do you know what I'm saying? It doesn't have to be a great tube that we put in this position. It just has to be able to oscillate. Stick it. Chinese tube in that position and see how it fares. Okay. So I think we're good to go there. So that's going to save him a little bit of money going with a Chinese tube in that position as opposed to, um, uh, you know, trying to get another RCA, a nicer RCA to put over in the the V2 position. It just makes more sense to do things this way. And that's one, uh, you know, that's uh, honestly, that's one thing that probably a lot of techs are not going to tell you um, unless you just ask them uh, to do this. Um, you know, they're in the business to, to sell you the tubes and, uh, you know, to make it right as they possibly can. And um, I think a lot of times techs don't see it from a consumer perspective. You know, where you can save a little bit by just swapping a, a tube around. And you can actually make your amp sound better in the process. There's no reason to leave a, um, you know, a new, uh, not a new old stock, but a, there's no reason to really leave an old RCA, a nice 12AX7 RCA tube uh, in a tremolo position. It just doesn't make any sense. As a matter of fact, that's one thing that you might even do with your old amps. Uh, figure out which position your tremolo tube is in and go in and uh, remove it if it has the original tube still in there. If you have an old RCA, GE, Sylvania, um, you know, Tung Sol, whatever tube in, uh, in that position, uh, you might consider just removing it and replacing it with a crappy, any old crappy Chinese tube will do, even if it's microphonic. All it has to do is oscillate. So, um, you know, put your lowest end tube in the tremolo position and and take the other tube out and save it for a rainy day so in case one of your preamp tubes goes bad you'll have a spare uh, nice RCA 12AX7 7025 or what have you yeah let's go ahead and stand this thing up um, 
and give it a listen.
yeah, that is a 1965 Gretsch model 6161. Hope you guys have enjoyed this video. If you have, please hit subscribe down below. Also hit the bell to receive all notifications. And for now, y'all take care.